Okay, welcome everyone. This is our second lecture of the Fishtails Lecture Series. That's an educational program of Crossroads at Big Creek in partnership with the Door County Library. Tonight, I think is gonna, uh, um, it's just gonna be a fascinating story about reconnecting sturgeon from the lower of Menominee to the upper part of the Menominee River. Um, and we have Dr. Forsyth to present that to us. Um, I characterize the work that's going on in the Menominee River right now as the biggest uh, sturgeon passage project in the Great Lakes. So it's very, uh, very important. And it combines uh, engineering tools and science tools to get fish up and downstream safely and to evaluate whether we're achieving the goals. And we'll hear about that shortly. But first, before I get into a formal uh, um, introduction, I want to also remind you there's two more lectures yet this year. Um, coming up on March 14th will be Emily Tyner, the Director of Freshwater what is it? Uh, Strategy at UWGB, and she's the primary person for the National Estuarine Research Reserve uh, Program that's now uh, developing its package to be approved by NOAA. As I may have mentioned last time, Yeah, the natural areas have been approved, and now they have to go through the, um, um, the EIS, the management strategy, and so on, and then at the end, maybe decide a site where the visitor center is going to go. We hope that's Sturgeon Bay, but we'll see. Anyway, I invited her Recording to come, in progress. Not, not so much to talk about the visitor center, but now that Sturgeon Bay will be part of the natural areas, what kind of programs is NOAA going to bring uh, and implement here? Uh, not only in the natural areas, but throughout Green Bay, because they won't do everything just within the natural areas. So don't, be sure to come back then. I hope we all come and show a great support for uh, Door County and Sturgeon Bay, especially uh, with our interest in the visitor center. And then the last uh, speaker will be April 11th, and that's Dr. Karen Murchie from The Shed. Uh, she's the sucker researcher that's been doing work up here for, I don't know, five or eight years, something like that. Um, she's focused a lot on the suckers that return to the streams, especially here in Sturgeon Bay, but a number of them. But now with the acoustic telemetry, um, she's put transmitters in those fish. So now she's going to tell us what she's learned about where they go when they leave the stream and not just when they return. So it's going to be very interesting. And if you saw her last time she was here, you know she's a great speaker. Um, <clears throat> You know, fishtails covered sturgeon in our first year in 2019. And that was when Rob Elliott uh, gave a presentation on um, uh, lake sturgeon restoration and rehabilitation throughout the Great Lakes. And he mentioned this project on the Menominee River. Um, now, uh, you know, a few years later, uh, they've been passing fish from 2015. And, and Dr. Forsyth has been involved in that evaluation. So I'm really interested to see you know, the status of the program as well. Uh, Dr. Forsyth has been a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay since the fall of 2011, after a short stint with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I should add. Um, <clears throat> he is a professor of biology and environmental science. He's the chair of the Environmental Science and Policy Graduate Program. He's also the chair of the Environmental Science Undergraduate Program and principal investigator of Aquatic Ecology and Fisheries Laboratory. He dabbles in, a multiple, uh, in multiple research areas, but the primary focus involves understanding reproductive ecology of fish, including factors that influence the timing of migratory behavior, determining the success and rates of mortality um, uh, on fish of early life stages, like eggs and larvae, and quantifying where fish tend to obtain their sources of energy. With that, Dr. Forsythe.
Okay, technical difficulties. Stay with me. All right, so you have all of these uh, population trajectories, right? 1870, 1890, you're looking at five Great Lakes here, lots of lake surgeons swimming around out there, and then populations start declining. And so, you know, uh, there's a problem. The other problem that we started to have for Lake Sturgeon is the use of rivers for navigation, use for rivers around here locally for transporting things like this, right, logging activity. You can see here that this log jam on the Menominee River, this was April 23rd, 1899, 6 million linear feet of logs in the Menominee River. There's not a sturgeon in the world that's going to be able to migrate to get from Point A to point B at the right time in the right place. So we have a problem. Um, and these are just some other pictures of you know, activities that you see historically um, around the region. And so if that wasn't you know, a challenge enough, uh, then we start to build these kind of structures around the Great Lakes, right? And you guys are all from here. You can point to pretty much every river, right? If you go around the Horn, you say Fox River, we have the De Pere Dam. We go to the Okano, Peshigoro River, Menominee River. We have hydroelectric facilities all over the place, which, again, um, were often sitted in places where surgeons spawned, because oftentimes there's a nick point where the water's dropping, so that's a good place to put a dam. And you remove surgeon spawning habitat. You block surgeon from reaching historical spawning habitats, and that becomes a problem, right? Again, uh, we want to get those sturgeon into a place where they can be successful, and, you know, we're blocking some of those migratory routes. So uh, this is, I'll give a shout out to Rob on this. This is a, one of his slides. So this is definitely one I stole from you. Uh, but early on, uh, when people started to really think about Lake Sturgeon and what are going to be the conservation activities that we need to restore populations, the logical first step is, you know, maybe 30 years ago was, what do we have out there? And so Rob and Mark and a few other people uh, really went around to try to, to quantify what our sturgeon populations looks like. And so here's a snapshot of uh, what we have uh, current adult abundance, around 3,000 individuals. It's probably been increasing over the last few years. And then you can see here in this pie chart, we can actually partition you know, the size of these populations. You can see that the biggest portion of the pie chart is the Menominee River. And so when you're somebody uh, like a fisheries biologist looking at this information, um, this is going to be one that you'd like to target, right? Um, it has a decent population. What's going on there? How do we, how do, we do something about this uh, problem? And so uh, if you look to the Menominee River, so we're going to kind of zoom in and focus in on what's going on here for this talk. So here's the length, a shortened length of the Menominee River. So you have Green Bay. And what I'm going to be talking about here is the portion of the river between the mouth of Green Bay and all the way up to Grand Rapids Dam. Okay, so that's the portion we're going to focus on. Um, this is a very highly industrialized portion of the river, at least downstream from the Menominee and Park Mill dams. Um, and this was the population that uh, many folks were looking at to say, okay, we have a, uh, a dam that's situated here what can we do about this, right? Can we get fish that are spawning below the Menominee Dam up to some of their historic habitats? And so um, here, uh, one of the first things that my lab did was actually to go in and to try to quantify if there was any reproduction occurring downstream of the Menominee Dam. And um, that actually turned out to be the case. So you can see our sampling effort in 2013, and the number of larvae that we collected just in that year, about 1,200 larvae, suggesting that those fish are producing um, larvae, but the larvae only have about a mile or so before they go out into the bay, and the logic is that many of those fish probably do not make it. It's not enough time for them to grow to a certain size where they can, um, you know, uh, where they're not really subjected to a lot of the predation out in the bay, okay? And so that's why I have this little skull and crossbones here is most of the larvae that are, going, that are produced from downstream of the Menominee Dam probably aren't surviving. Um, and so what we really want to do is increase the survival of these little guys. Now, you guys may have seen adult lake sturgeon, but here's actually what the babies look like swimming around in this video. Okay, 
And not only do we want to see the survival of the babies increase, but what you really want eventually is to get to juvenile fish that have higher survival rates that are going to do quite well when they get down into the bay, okay? And that's really the whole idea behind the Menominee River Passage Project. There's a couple of other details about this section of the river that I wanted to share because this is going to play a role in what we've discovered. So here uh, you have the portion of the Menominee River between the Park Mill Dam and the Grand Rapids Dam. And there is some number of resident adult fish that are already in that section. The Fish and Wildlife Service has quantified that. The DNR has quantified that. And so uh, we have to be aware that when we're, if we were able to move fish upstream, you're moving fish into a population where adults already exist. Okay? So that's going to be a key point. So we already have fish up there. Um, but if you were able to move those adults upstream, number one, you have a situation where you have this entire river length now that those adults can use. And you're increasing, you can see, the habitat for spawning by a large margin. So on the left side, you have what's available downstream, and then you can see what's available upstream if we were able to get those adults upstream of the Menominee Dam. And so that is a reason, potentially, for looking at this. Uh, equally important thing is if we have successful reproduction, if we move those fish and they successfully reproduce, you're going to have a large river length for all of those larvae and juveniles to now stay in the river for a period of time, grow, and then eventually make their way down to Green Bay. Okay, So you're giving them more habitat. Um, as a matter of fact, you're increasing habitat for juvenile lake sturgeon in this upper region by a tenfold. Okay, So if we can move the adult fish, you're giving them more habitat to spawn. And then you're giving their offspring a better chance of survival as they move downstream. Okay, so you're doing two things simultaneously. And that's really what the biologists wanted to accomplish with this project. Um, and I want to take a moment here, just a couple of slides, to uh, acknowledge all of the various partners everybody yeah you know the these groups that came together to make this work i'll show you guys some videos here and sort of what this looks like but um there have been just an enormous amount of funding people coming together um rob and mark were part of this um uh, and so uh want to take a moment to acknowledge that also there have been lots of people through uh, the Michigan DNR, the Wisconsin DNR, at, people at UWGB, uh, through power companies and uh, consulting companies, and you know all of these various sources that had to come together to, to realize a project of this scope. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge everybody that uh, has worked on this, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a list that I stole from Rob uh, a while ago. Um, so. If you're a biologist and you're looking at this situation, uh, we need to move adult fish from down here below the Menominee Dam, and we want to move them upstream, all right? Uh, how do you get that done? Um, and I would have loved to have been in the room when you guys started talking about this. It probably was wild. I know what we're going to do. We are going to work with engineers, and we're going to build an elevator inside this old you know, dam structure, and it's going to work. You know, these fish are going to move into that elevator. We're going to lift them up, and we're going to be able to sort them. Uh, uh, but there was a lot of engineering and a lot of work that had to go into it. So uh, you're seeing sort of the side of the Menominee Dam. Uh, you're seeing the elevator that would eventually have to be constructed to have the fish swim in and then move up to the top so they can be sorted. Um, I've seen Rob do this a few times where he put fish into the slide that have to go back down. So there's this little slide that goes back down, uh, fish that you're going to put down below the Menominee River that you don't want to pass upstream. Um, and then you can see some pictures of all of this infrastructure that needed to happen. But the conversations must have just been fantastic, right? Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make this work. And then they, they, they went to work and they got it done. Uh, here's some other pictures from the process of what this looks like. Here's the slide that I was talking about that uh, fish that are moved into the elevator are sorted, uh, that you don't want to move upstream, come back down. You see all the holding tanks and 
uh, sort of excited people uh, ready to sort fish. Now, I'm sure that when the elevator was constructed, you have cameras pointing inside the elevator, and you're thinking to yourself, this is, spend a lot of money on this. This is going to work, right? Uh, I'm sure that they were very excited when uh, this happened. Um, so an elevator, you're looking down at the base of the elevator that's just full of adult sturgeon uh, ready to, to move upstream. And so the process now is when this happens, um, you're going to bring them up in the elevator and uh, everybody's here sort of waiting to, uh, for the fish to spill out. You'll see this in a second. Uh, we're going to hold the fish for a while, collect biological information from all the fish, decide which ones get passed, which ones don't get passed. Um, just a fantastic process overall, right? I don't know about you guys, but I could watch this all day. I, I don't know. My wife thinks I'm weird, but... Uh, you know, okay, so it works, right? We can bring fish up into this elevator. We can sort them. We can decide which ones we're going to pass. Uh, there's also other things, all this biological information that we can collect. Uh, so here's uh, ultrasound systems. We can look at uh, males versus females. You know, how many females do you want to pass? How many males do you want to pass? What size of fish do you want to pass? All of this stuff sort of goes into the into the passage uh, agenda. Um, what's cool though about this, uh, yes, it's, it's fantastic that you can, you can draw fish into this elevator, you can move them up and then you can give this, them the opportunity to spawn upstream. But there's, there was just a wild opportunity for learning when you're a research biologist, right? You start looking at this and you're like, well, how many questions, you know, there's so many questions that we have, right? So just read a couple of these. So uh, are the fish in spawning condition, right? The ones that we bring up in the elevator, are they ready to spawn? Um, how do you decide which ones go upstream versus which ones go back downstream? Uh, what's the best time of the year to run the elevator, right? So this is expensive. You have to have people there. So maybe you can think about certain times of the year you want to run the elevator. Maybe there are certain times of the year it's more successful. You get more fish versus fewer fish. Um, what's the size and the sex ratio of the adults that you're going to collect? And so uh, Rob and, and a, a bunch of people were involved with trying to answer some of these questions, just the mechanics of how we actually go about operating the elevator itself, okay? Um, then there became other research questions, sort of, okay, once we have these things worked out at the elevator itself, uh, we call this research phase one, and that is simply, you can move the fish, but will they stay upstream, right? I don't know about you guys, but if I was a fish and I got drawn into an elevator and raised up two stories, dumped into a holding tank, and then trucked all the way upstream past two dams, and you put me back in the river, I'm going to be like, no way, I'm out of here, <laughs> right? And that was a concern, Will the fish stay upstream? Um, if they stay upstream, how long do they stay? What's the rate of movement? So will they continue to, to go upstream? Uh, if they go upstream, are they at the right place at the right time to spawn? Will they do this in the spring? Is their movement consistent with spawning migrations? All of those things, okay? But you really want to know, will the fish stay upstream and will they spawn, right? Will they go up to the Grand Rapids Dam? And so uh, Dan Iserman, uh, he presented a few weeks ago. Uh, his team was the first team to tackle research question number one. And you can read this last bullet point right here. Uh, the transferred lake sturgeon moved upstream and have the potential for reproductive success. That's what they concluded. So the way that they concluded this is they put acoustic tags in fish that they uh, captured at the elevator. They did this from 2014 to 2018. 91% of those fish stayed upstream, and their movements were consistent with spawning migrations at the right time at the right place. So I have this little guy here. You know, everybody's like, yes, okay, this is fantastic. We can collect the fish, we can move them upstream, and they're going to stay up there for a period of time consistent with spawning activity. All right? Consistent with spawning activity. 
Well, the the follow up question you could have is, you know, they're moved, they stay. And they seem to go upstream to where spawning habitat is available. That's great, right? The second question became, well, are these, are these adults actually contributing babies to the overall production? So are they successfully reproducing? This became research phase number two. So this is when my team and a few other people jumped in. And our question was, can we determine the contribution of adult lake sturgeon to annual recruitment within the Park Mill Grand Rapids section of the Menominee River? Saying this another way, we wanted to provide validation that the fish that were transferred went upstream, they spawned, and they successfully reproduced. We wanted the smoking gun. We wanted to be able to say, yes, this is going to happen. And so uh, interestingly enough, uh, around the time that we uh, were conducting this study, there's been a whole lot of genetic capabilities that have increased with fisheries ecology. So we're at the time where we can take any adult that was moved upstream and then we compare it with any larvae based on their genetics. And so this became a genetic exercise in determining this. So what do we need to do? All right. Um, well, First of all, we had to go collect larvae, which is not easy to do, uh, mostly because the larvae drift at night, and so you, this becomes all night work. You have to pinpoint when the adults spawn, and then the eggs will incubate for a while, and I'm too old for this stuff anymore, so I send all of my graduate students out there to do this stuff. And so you do nighttime drift netting. This is, these are the nets here that we use. And then here's the portion of the... Menominee River right below the Grand Rapids Dam where we targeted our larval production. We thought, based on telemetry, that most of the adults that were passed plus the resident fish spawned somewhere up in this channel. So that's where we targeted our larval collection. That's where we thought that the baby making was happening. So that's where we were at. Here's some other pictures of uh, the Menominee River. This is the base of the Grand Rapids Dam, you have the power canal, you have this side channel that comes off where the spillway is, and then this picture right here is looking upstream where we thought that most of that spawning activity was occurring. So we did this for two years, uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, anytime you're doing larval sampling like this, you have your fingers crossed because you're like, are, are they are we going to catch any larvae, right? Um, and we did, uh, fortunately. We caught 985 larvae in 2020, and 2021 seemed like a banner year, 9,563 larvae. Uh, we took a proportion of those randomly selected larvae, 500 from each year, uh, and those were subjected to our genetic analysis, trying to tie the adults that were passed to the babies that we collected. All we wanted to do was find one one larvae attached to one adult, that would have been good enough, right? Um, it's tough though. This is genetic work is tough. You got to go into the lab, have to extract DNA. This goes off to another lab. We worked with folks at Michigan State to make this happen. My graduate student set up shop um, and uh, have to do fin clips and all of this all fancy stuff here to extract DNA to, from the adults and the larvae to try to tie these together. Now, don't fall asleep on me here. I'm going to walk through this slide. We're going to talk a little bit of genetics, okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to show you guys how this works. It'll be clear as mud when I'm done, okay? All right. So what we do is we extract DNA, and we go into certain regions of the sturgeon DNA. We do this at 18 different locations, small little regions of DNA, okay? We do this consistently across adults and larvae. And then what you do is you take those regions of DNA and you simply ask, does the larvae have it and does the parent have the same genetics across all of those 18 locations? And so here in this table, what I have is a variety of DNA locations, A through J. Let's say you have adult surgeon, parent one. This was a past adult upstream. And then you have three larvae. Then we just can line up zeros and ones, all right? So... If you had a parent that had all ones and you had a larvae that also had all ones, that's 100% consistent with that larvae coming from that adult, 
okay? If you had a parent with all ones and a larvae with all zeros, no match, okay? So this becomes just a probability of does this larvae match this adult? And we can use fancy statistics to come up with these probabilities. I'm not going to get into it. This is actually what the genetic data looks like. So here you could have these three IDs. So maybe this column right here, this is your parent. These are your two larvae. And we just do zeros and ones. Do they match or they don't match? Okay, and we do this across a bunch of what we call microsatellite DNA locations. Everybody with me? Okay. That's the, that's the fanciest part of this entire lecture, all right? So then what we can do in our computer simulations is we can come in and we can start to match all of our larvae. And we have lots of larvae to work with, right? We have 1,000 larvae. We have hundreds of adults. So now we run this fancy com computer simulation to tell us this larvae probably belongs to this adult. This larvae probably belongs to that adult, okay? And that's all done with fancy computers. I want to remind you that the goal of this was that we only needed one larvae to assign to one adult that was passed upstream, and everybody would be happy, okay? Everybody would be happy, because that's the smoking gun. It worked, right? Um, but we can do a little bit better than that, we found, okay? So here's another couple of questions for you. So we have adult lake sturgeon that were collected downstream of the Menominee Dam, and we put those sturgeon upstream, and they're going to mix with the resident fish, right? So we have three possible parental combinations that you could see out of that mixture. So we could have larvae that come from parents that are just resident to that region of the river, right? So you could have babies that come from resident fish only. So that's one group that we could look for. We also have larvae that can come from parents that have been passed upstream. So these are larvae that come from two past fish, right? Somehow they found each other, like this wonderful couple here and married for so long. They found each other, the Menominee River, right? And they produced offspring. And then this final group is you could have a mixed parentage, right? So you could have larvae from a past adults, to the resident adults. So those are the three possibilities. Not only can we look for that smoking gun, but we can look for these three groups. So in our genetic analysis, these are the two groups that were going to be really important to us because not only would it be, yes, the passage project is working, but we also, these are larvae that would not have been produced if we would not have passed those fish, right? So that's an important group. So here's our table of larval production, okay? So here's the three groups of fish that I talked about previously. You follow this matrix right here up on top, okay? So we have larvae from parents resident to the upstream section of the river. We assign 239 larvae out of the 580 fish that we, we looked at for this year, two larvae that were, or two parents that were resident to that upstream section. So those fish were already there. Here, we have 47 larvae that we collected from parents, two parents that were passed upstream. So here's your smoking gun. At least 50 of those larvae came from fish that were passed upstream. And then we had a combination of these two things, 139 plus 155 that came from mixed parentage, okay? So about half of the fish, the larvae that we collected, came from reproduction that involved past adult lake sturgeon, okay? So not only do we have one larvae, we have many, many, many larvae. And then if you go over here to this table, this was 2020, 2021, you can sort of see the same numbers, okay? So not only did it work in one year, it worked in two consecutive years, one year where we had very few larvae produced, one year where we had lots of larvae produced, those past adults were in the mix and they were reproducing. Some other things that we can glean from this data, we can, we can say, well, you know, did a, a transferred female prefer to mate with males that were also transferred or do they prefer to mate with fish that were passed? So we looked at all of those combinations. Um, what we found is that 
Migratory females, the ones that we passed upstream, those mate pre mated preferentially with the uh, resident males, probably because there were just more of them up there, right? So but we can look at this. These other figures get back to a little bit about how you operate potentially this facility. So what we also found is that males and females passed later in a season had a greater chance of producing larvae on average. And so if you're thinking about, well, how should we run this? Should it be earlier, later? It looks like the adults that you pass in the fall, so August, September, have a higher probability of producing larvae potentially. So this might get back to how you operate the facility. Another question could be, well, should we be concerned about the size of the fish that we're moving upstream? Logic would suggest, well, let's get the biggest ones up there. Well, we found that it's not necessarily, bigger is not always better in this case. Larger adults do not always have a greater chance of reproductive success. So maybe you don't have to be as concerned about that if you're managing the facility, right? So we have all of this other information that has come out of this. Back to the main part of the story, though, it looks like the passage project is putting fish upstream in the right time, putting them in the right place for successful reproduction. It's working, right? So if we have these fish going successfully upstream, now we have a third question, right? So you're producing all of these larvae, producing more larvae than you would produce without those fish. And now assuming that you've given these larvae all the wonderful habitat that they need, they're gonna survive, they're gonna grow. Now you have all of these fish in the upper Menominee River. Are they eventually gonna come down through the dams? Because you what you really want is to replay this cycle, right? You want the juveniles to come through. You want them to go to the bay. You want them to grow fast, get big, reach reproductive age, and then they would get transferred upstream, right? Complete the entire cycle. That's the ultimate goal of this project. And so we started looking at this, uh, this next research phase. And this is the Park Mill Dam, just right upstream from the Menominee. And we're looking at this, and we're trying to, trying to figure out how we design a project to look at downstream juvenile telemetry when they have all of these different ways that they can move around the dams, right? Will they come back downstream? Will they be successful? Will they survive the plunge over the dam? Will they come through this power canal? If they go through the spinning turbines and through a gate, are they just going to get chummed up and not survive? Are they going to get impinged on some of these, uh, these gates in front of the turbines? And so this became the next research phase. Uh, and so we had lots of questions, started to evaluate the system. Folks that designed the passage structure also put in downstream structures to allow the fish to go through. It would be nice to know if the fish are using them as they're moving downstream. Um, so again, lots of different questions, opportunities to grow and learn. And so this next third phase of the research project is all about downstream juvenile movement. What happens to those juvenile fish? Do they survive? Do they eventually make it back out to the bay? So our specific questions are to investigate the interaction of those baby fish as they're moving around the dams to quantify the number of fish that are surviving and which path they take. We will really want to figure this out. And so, um, again, uh, you know, graduate students come in and they're excited. They want to jump on this and here's some pictures. But the first thing that we had to do is we had to go back to the drawing board and collect larvae again. So more night work. So I hired graduate students that love being out in the river at night. <laughs> they're like, yes, they're gung ho. They went back up to this portion of the, of the Menominee River and you can see all of these uh, wonderful pictures of them out working. We do actually collect a lot of other cool things in the river too that are drifting downstream. Um, and so uh, in 2023, so just this past year was our first year of larval sampling. Uh, we ended up collecting a lot of larvae again, somewhere on the order of 4,000 larvae upstream. Um, these two figures show what the water temperature looked like on this figure leading up to all of the larvae that we collected 
and that was a river discharge. You can see that the Menominee River was raging just before we started collecting larvae. We were a little concerned that our sampling efforts were not going to go well, uh, but um, turns out that it was it was just fine. Um, and so the interesting thing is once you get these larvae in hand, we can't take the larvae to a hatchery. They have to stay in their water. They have to imprint on this water so we can get these fish to come back to the Menominee River. So we started working with the Michigan DNR. They had one of these trailers uh, ready to go for us. They weren't going to use it, so they said we can borrow it. Um, our first thought was to put this trailer on this side of the Menominee Dam where you see the X. Seems like it would be really easy to get power to this trailer when it's sitting right next to a hydropower facility. Apparently not. So we had to readjust. Um, and so we worked with the Wisconsin DNR. They stepped up big time for us in a pinch because we were collecting these larvae and we ended up moving to the Wisconsin side of the river with the Michigan DNR trailer. Uh, and uh, we ended up setting up shop here at Nest Egg Marine uh, in, um, Menominee and a uh, big shout out to Nestig. They stepped up for us. They were able to get power so we can plug in our trailer. Um, and this is, uh, what this thing looks like. It's, um, it's a relatively small facility. You know, you're doing this all stream side. We're pumping in water from the Menominee river. You can see, uh, my graduate students working, cleaning out tanks, getting ready for the season. The larvae uh, end up going into these small tanks first. This is where we get food. We can get food directly in front of them, and then they go increasingly to larger size tanks. It takes a lot of work, a lot of husbandry, a lot of counting, a lot of measuring. Um, so here's a quiz question. How many sturgeon larvae are in this pan? Anybody have a guess? And yes, they will not sit still. This is a picture. Anybody want to guess? Yeah. <laughs> you can do it that way. Just give me a, what's your first gut feeling? How many sturgeon are in this pan? 200? 125? All right. It's like, it's like looking at the jelly beans in the jar, right? 192. 192. 192 babies in that. And so we have to count them and we have to uh, take care of them on a daily basis. We have to make lots of food for them. Um, and so here you have five brine shrimp jars that are all going simultaneously. And lake sturgeon are like little pigs. They want to eat all the time and you have to get food in front of their face or mortality is really high. Now, really what we want to do is get to that size. So you want to feed them a lot, right? So lots and lots of time and effort of um, putting this piece together, okay? So like I said, uh, the Wisconsin DNR stepped up. We got our trailer. We got everything rolling. Fish were coming into the trailer. Um, and uh, we were able to pick and choose, uh, figure out how many we could start with. And then we start feeding them. And... Uh, like I said, when I say that they eat a lot, here's a couple of young sturgeon just diving into piles of bloodworms. They like sit on top of it, and that's where they hang out. Um, and so we feed them like this for multiple times a day. Um, takes a lot of money, time, and effort. But my crew was fantastic this past summer. They really got their hands on how to uh, raise these fish, uh, how to feed them, keep them alive. Um, and so it was, it was a great summer of experience for all of them, but this is what we ended up with. So, uh, you eventually get to the fish to this size and now we can run a research project, right? And so, uh, what, so what did we do with the fish? Well, uh, we went back to a couple of methods to try to track the fish. The first one was acoustic telemetry. Maybe some of you guys are familiar with acoustic telemetry. Some of you guys aren't, but essentially we're just putting a tag inside the fish that transmits a signal, and then we can pick up on that signal. When you're dealing with fish this small, there's a couple of small tag options you can see on the top of the screen. We were using the V5, V7 tags. 
Um, and uh, we have to go through the surgical process. This means, uh, you know, painstaking, trying to figure out, you know, how to keep these uh, fish alive during surgery. It turns out, though, that uh, juvenile sturgeon actually do pretty well during the surgical process. Uh, you can flip them over. We can use a little bit of anesthetic. Um, this is what the surgical wound looked like after three days. This is what it looked like after six days, right? So we're putting all these transmitters in there, and they, and they heal up just fine. While we were raising the fish, we were working in the Menominee River to deploy all of the receivers. These receivers are going to pick up on the sturgeon after we release them. We decided uh, that these locations would be the best on the Menominee River, so they are around the Park Mill Dam, around the Menominee Dam, so we can try to pick up on these fish if they were to leave the system. This is what an acoustic receiver looks like, and there's the fish that you see there ready to go. Another few pictures of uh, sturgeon and the whole process. This is one of my grad students, Zach. Uh, he's taking the lead on the acoustic telemetry piece. Um, he um, was a student from uh, um, Maine, actually, and was working with acoustic telemetry before, so had a lot of experience. The other thing that we do is we also pit tag the fish. And so I know that most of you guys are probably familiar with pit tags because this is what they put in our pets, our animals. Your dog has a pit tag. My dog has a pit tag, most likely. Uh, and so all the fish that we collected were pit tagged before they were released. And then we were playing around with these uh, what are called Litz cord antennas that we were going to deploy downstream from the Menominee Dam as a final location to try to pick up on these fish as they were moving downstream. Not going to talk too much about this because this was just one piece of the project, sort of an ongoing um, uh, technology that we're trying to figure out. Um, here's a video. I think it's going to play. Maybe. Well, there was a video there showing the, the pit tagging procedure, uh, but it doesn't look like it's going to work for me. So what do we end up with? 2023, our release numbers look something like this. So uh, we came into the trailer. 2,439 fish that we brought back from drift after counting them all up. 602 fish survived up until the end of September, early part of October. Seems like a lot of mortality, but this was actually not too bad coming out of this trailer for the first time. Um, you kind of expect these waves of mortality with sturgeon early in life. Sometimes they just don't move on to the food all that well. So they end up dying, but my grad students really got a handle of it. 558 fish were re released with pit tags. 44 fish had acoustic tags plus pit tags. We were able to monitor their length, so we know the length of the fish at the time that we released them. We also know the weight of the fish. Um, and so a bunch of biological information from all those fish that were released. We're also using a genetic procedure to be able to tell us of the 602 fish that were released, how many were boys and how many were girls as well? This is kind of new genetic technology. So not only can I tell you how many, but soon enough I'll be able to tell you which ones were boys and which ones were girls, which is kind of interesting. This is the moment that the fish were released. We're going back in time. So these are all of the pit tag acoustic fish being dropped into the upper Menominee River. So it was an exciting day for us. Every day, those students had to be there on that trailer feeding these fish. And so I can tell you that that was a moment <laughs> of relief for all of them. So what did we find? We're almost to the end of the story. This is what we have so far. So we released the fish uh, September, October. Um, and here in the red, you see the locations where we detected fish. Six fish out of the 44 immediately took off out of the Menominee River. They were gone within a couple of days. Why did they do that? Were they boys or girls? Who knows? We'll find out that uh, in, uh, in the future. Interestingly enough, all six fish, we believe, did not go through this portion of the Menominee River upstream of the Park Mill. We did not detect any at this pit tag location within the Menominee Dam, which means that they probably, most of them came over the spillway. 
And they also did the same thing at the Menominee Dam, over the spillway, over the spillway, and they were out, okay? Um, once this happened, shortly after our, our release, the river froze up, and we've been out. So uh, my crew is really anxious to get back into the Fox River, or sorry, Menominee River, and to go check these receivers and see what's going on. It's been a wonderful opportunity for my grad students. This is uh, a few of them and one undergrad here. We went to the National Conference of the American Fisheries Society in Grand Rapids. They had an opportunity to present their research there. Uh, so not only is the project facilitating conservation and management of sturgeon, but also facilitating the careers of all of these students that are involved with this project. And that's that's an important piece of this story as well. I believe that, uh, you know, it's been 20, 30 years of a lot of conservation and research for Lake Surgeon specifically, probably one of the most studied fish in the Great Lakes. Are we on a road to recovery? I think so. I also think the Menominee River Project and all of the people that worked on this, on the passage of uh, piece of it as well, have really put a stamp on this for me, they, they will recover, right? And this is going to be a big piece of that. So um, here's a picture of me. I do get out in the field every once in a while, although this is when I was 22 or 23. Um, this was a fish that I, uh, that I sampled on the Upper Black River in Michigan. This was actually the first female lake sturgeon that I ever collected, and I've been hooked now for 20 years. So uh, if there was going to be some young people in the room, I was going to say, you never know where you're going to end up. I didn't even know what a lake sturgeon was 20 years ago. I, I grew up in a cornfield in central Illinois. How I ended up studying lake sturgeon up here in Door County, doing this stuff, I'll never know. So for those of you that have young kids, young you know, tell them, just, just go for something and it'll work out. So that's my story. You guys have any questions for me about this uh, project? Yes. Oh. I was wondering if, if it matters, uh, what depth you release the little guys. Um, we didn't pay too much attention to water depth for the most part. Uh, you know, we found with previous projects on the Fox River that uh, as long as we were far enough upstream to where we could ensure that we could track them as they were moving down, that was the biggest element for us. Um, otherwise, you know, our, the, the acoustic transmitters themselves and the receivers, we did a bunch of drone work where we kind of floated transmitters by these buoys and it would pick up on the fish pretty much every time. So all that was vetted. And, and do you sample the water temperature or is that important? Um, we, uh, fortunately, there's a few gauging stations on the Menominee River, so we don't have to mess with water temperature too much. We just gather up that information from the gauging stations later. Um, we didn't, uh, we weren't too concerned about water temperature at that time, especially because the trailer itself, the water was coming directly from the Menominee River, so there was no difference between the water that they were reared in and what we put them in. Um, so they were just released and on their way. Yeah. yeah I got a quick question. Uh, yeah. They're going to um, want to throw the microphone down to you. <laughs> your receivers, you said your, your, your team was frozen out. Yes. Do the receivers uh, continue to record and uh, maintain that data and you just have to go back and collect it in the spring? Yeah, a great question. I should have mentioned this. So uh, there is continuous recording. The receivers are still in the river right now. Uh, the tags that we put in the fish have a limited battery life uh, because they're so small. Uh, I, we also tag Northern Pike with tags about this big that could last up to seven years. Our tags will last just over a year. So if those fish stay up there and they swim around, we should be able to pick up on him on them for roughly a year. We're going to replicate this project for another two years. Every, it's an expensive project because every tag is four hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, Merry Christmas. I have two questions. One would be, 
why do you not put all the sturgeon above? What's wrong with the ones that you returned back to the lower river? Um, Rob could probably answer that question better than me, but you're talking about the adults that are passed upstream. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, there was a bunch of biological qualities that they were looking for in the fish. So most of it's based on size. So, you know, you have a certain size threshold that you want to be above those fish would be passed. And then the other, if they were too small, then they would be moved downstream. I assume that some fish that were maybe in poor health, you know, were moved downstream, but those are the qualities basically that we're looking for. Yeah, they, a lot of them had to go through um, health checks. Yeah. Most of them are perfectly fine and healthy. Um, there's a portion of them that are just too young. They're teenagers. They're not ready to reproduce yet. So. One more question here. That stretch of them, how many? What is the water depth? Are there a lot of deep holes, or is it relatively a shallow river for the whole stretch? It's quite variable, actually. Uh, you know, when you go downstream from the Grand Rapids Dam, you know, there are shallow portions to riffles to, you know, larger holes. As you move towards the Park Mill Dam, it becomes almost like a lake environment. And, you know, and that's what we were sort of interested in, you know, will these juvenile fish just stay downstream in the reservoir? Will they have any reason to actually move down through the dam will they just stay there um but it, it's a it's a really mixed habitat of a river upstream you know you get pretty much every riverine environment you can possibly imagine and the fish it turns out are uh the naturally produced fish the juveniles are using the entire stretch of the of the river itself right it's a good question yeah i got a question here is there going to come a day where you're not going to have to intervene with the elevator yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that was always the goal, right? Um, where, you know, eventually you get enough production and um, you wouldn't have to pass fish. As of right now, um, you know, I think that, that it's going to continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, but I, I think it's it, – every project has an end life. Um, and, I, and I think that that was always the vision for the Menominee Project at some point. Yeah. Thank you. This might be out of your territory, but I happened to be on the Milwaukee shoreline and they were introducing sturgeon into the Milwaukee River. Yeah. And uh, they were charging $10 a fish and I just happened to have four grandkids there. And when they <laughs> did it the first time, they wanted to do it over a few times. So I got a substantial investment in that. Have, have you heard anything how that program's going? <laughs> I have not. I'm no. aware of the program. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to wait a while. <laughs> Yeah. So, Gary, yeah, um, that's one of six stocking projects going on around Lake Michigan. So they've been stocking those sturgeon for about uh, close to 20 years now. Um, you didn't have to pay, but by doing that, his, his grandkids will get a notice whenever those fish, when they grow up and they've all got a tag in them, not the $300 tags, the $2 tags. But... Yes, and then 20 years from now, that fish will show up somewhere, and they'll get a postcard telling them where that fish is. Yeah. Yeah. But you're looking at 12 to 15 years for a male to come back, longer than that for a female. So you'll have to wait a while, but I, I do hope you get uh, but some notification. That would be fantastic. As I understand it, some of the reared fish that we released have returned as males. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I Other questions? <laughs> Make me come all the way up. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think of this earlier. Uh, uh, what are the major predators of these juveniles that are as long as your hand or maybe a foot long? Probably not many. Um, you know, once they get to a certain size uh, threshold, you know, um, it, with all the, the bony, I wish I had my pictures up here, with, but all the scoots, wouldn't be, you know, a fantastic meal trying to go down um, and get to a certain point. But there's there are a lot of predators on the larvae uh, within the river system. So once they get past the gauntlet of those predators a few months down the road, 
probably somewhat impervious to most uh, predators, which is why if you give those fish enough habitat upstream, you're going to likely increase their survival, right? Rather than going into the bay where we have the, the bigger predators out there. Thank you. Had a you had a question? Sure. Saw increased, uh, you know, return of, of fish. Yeah. Isn't that shouldn't that be part of the study though to track them when they're out in the lake and you know I know it's limited to the lifetime of the the, the, the sensor that you have. But yeah. How many of them that you put in actually come back? You know, you talked about embedding you know the, na the natural habitat that they were in yeah. will they continue to come back to that that spot or is it just uh you know as a result of uh, maybe the population that exists in the in in, in the great lakes that uh, were there that are are growing and, and coming back yeah it makes a difference but it seemed to me that you'd, you'd want to have that is the phase four or five. Yeah, man, I can go on forever on that question or comment. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I, I think that ultimately you would want to have a situation where you would release, say, a juvenile fish that was the result of this passage project and then track that individual all the way back to the Menominee River as a reproductive adult. That would be wonderful. I don't think we have the technology that exists for us to do that at this point in time. There could be opportunities for genetic tags, right? If we had the genetics of those individuals, we probably could tie those the, the reproductive history of the fish to some of those events. Um, beyond that, that would be really tough to be able to, to do. Um, I think as though, as, as you start to see an increase in the population size, it would be some evidence that what you're doing is working as well, right? Um, there is fairly strong evidence, though, that if we raise fish on the Nominee River water source, if they imprint on that source, they're likely going to come back to the Menominee River to reproduce, which is why that imprinting is so critical. Um, there's always going to be some straying across rivers from source populations, but largely those fish should come back based on our understanding of you know the natal imprinting of those fish so i don't know rob if you want to have do you have any more to add to that um i think it's it's sort of a different question in the role of researchers and the role of the management agencies so the states of wisconsin and michigan for decades have tracked the populations in the menominee river and do population estimate work every year so that's where some of the numbers of how many fish are between each of the sections of the dam and how many fish come back below the river. So over time, they'll continue to do those surveys and see whether the abundance of fish coming back starts increasing. Plus, over the years, all the fish that they handle get the little tags, the inexpensive ones that stay with them for their entire life. Then you can start seeing we which hope, fish we are hope coming they. back. <laughs> Most of them stay with yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I think there is the way... And there are plans for long-term evaluation, but it's sort of a count the numbers, see how quickly they increase in, uh, in abundance. Are there any plans on releasing any fish above any of the other dams on the Menominee? Um, I haven't heard any chatter about that. I don't think so. I don't think so at this time. Yes, there are. But to go to the next step. There's sturgeon in every pool, right? Yes, there's there are. Some, there all are. the way up to Sturgeon Falls. Yes, that's my understanding. It's just that they're limited. Yes. They're, they may or may not be growing. We don't know. Yeah. No. I think you guys, you, the, these two gentlemen up here would have to come out of retirement to make that happen. Um, but I, I haven't heard of any conversation about that. It's a good question. And I, it would be great to see that happen if it could. But. Probably not. Power company for the future. Fish passage works the first two dams. And yet all the power dams have to get relicensed every 30 or 40 years. Retirement. Retirement. Working. As long as they eventually get them all the way upstream. Then you have the next set of dams put in. So for those on Zoom, Rob is explaining that if this is, is successful at the two lower dams, it, it provides on the upper dams to maybe get passage that way too. Or 
they, <clears throat> depending upon how the power generation works, it'd be kind of cool if they would just take some of the dams out. Then there'd be a natural. I would actually, I would say, passage. I would say it slightly a different way. We have proven that it's successful at the downstream dam. It should be considered upstream if something comes up. So, due to the reaction just of this audience watching the elevator work, yeah. Uh, and how we all were like, wow, that is really cool. Mm -hmm. And we all became like little children. Um, are, do you or are you planning on opening for visitor viewing the elevator while it's in operation and explaining as part of an education program what's going on? Yeah, it's a really... Good question, and um, all I can offer is that I'm unfortunately not in charge of the hydro facility, um, and uh, I have taken classes through the hydro uh, facility to look at the elevator, to watch it work, uh, many classes over the years, actually, and you know, as hydro facilities change companies and change people and change policies, it's been increasingly more challenging to do that, but there are mechanisms to to, to take tours, I believe. Um, but it's it's not as easy, unfortunately, as just wa just walking up and being like, "I'm here for my tour." Can I go? Uh, it's it's unfortunately not like that. Yeah, but I it, wish it was. Yeah. But it has happened every year, usually for a day or two in the fall. Um, I don't know if it gets in the news over here. It gets in the news in Marinette Menominee, and there's usually about 200 people that can go through the tour uh, in an afternoon and evening. So it almost every year over the last five years, those tours have been available. And it's either in the spring or the fall. The power company helps organize them, and then the agency people show up and run the tours and explain questions. So keep your ears open. Yeah. See, I haven't heard about the tours either, so I, I don't know. Great. So I have a, just a, some simple comments uh, or, or perspectives. Certainly, I think much of you, many of you have probably heard in the news recently about the sturgeon being listed, being petitioned to be listed as endangered, and it's going through that process. Um, and some people are really afraid of that. Um, and, and maybe, and there are populations that are doing very well, and I assume somehow they will not maybe be under that, some of the edicts of that. But the one comment I want to make was when, when Rob and I was working, we had a supervisor that was in fisheries that also worked on ecological services program and even in the endangered species program. And he, when, when we got started on this, now this goes back to the first, con the first Great Lakes Basin Conference held was in 2000. And that's when we sort of laid down the parameters. What everybody working on sturgeon? What, what were the issues that you had? What were the um, um, impediments to success and all that? So that we could, you know, focus base and wide on that. And actually, since that meeting, Rob was part of a, a group of folks that would organize annual sturgeon meetings across the basin to to be coordinated across the agencies, across the NGOs. But our supervisor told us, he said, you know. Sturgeon may be uh, uh, petitioned to be listed. So when we start now, we should act as though it's already listed. What were the things that you would do if you're listed? What would be required for you to do uh, to uh, get the species off the endangered species list? And that's rung true, at least uh, when I was part of it, and I'm sure it still is. And we are doing the very things that would be required by the Endangered Species Act in coordination with all the state agencies um, and so on. So <clears throat> we're, we're ahead of that game because, you know, you could, you know, I don't know, a female sturgeon has how many eggs? Millions. Lots. You could take the progeny from one sturgeon, rear them up, and put them upstream and say, oh, look, it's a success. But that doesn't do much for the long-term sustainability and in genetic diversity. You have to be disciplined about how you do that. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, all these people involved, all the states and everybody involved, have been disciplined about this. And it's going to be a great example of how agencies can come together and uh, restore and enhance 
this ancient fish. Imagine the ability for sturgeon to pass those two dams has been impeded for almost 100 years. And now they're reconnected again, at least for that part. So for that, I told you this would be a fascinating story. And let's give Patrick a great big round of applause. Thank you. Don't miss the next two. They're going to be just as good. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. 